Sorry about that. That's actually going to be a really good illustration later on in my sermon today. <laughs> it is. Um, yeah, I prepare, two ser- oh, I prepare one sermon, you preach it in the morning, you preach it at night. So this opening sort of question may or may not fall flat, depending on which generation you're from, and I'm trying to find a generation where it might work. <laughs> but we'll see, right? Who's heard of the show, TV show Dallas? Hands up. There's not one hand in the building. Surely there's one. There's a couple. All right, Ollie, I'm going to pick on you. Um, in the show Dallas, what do you reckon was the most significant episode? Do you remember? <laughs> Man, I'm stuffed. All right, there's a TV show called Dallas, and the most important episode was an episode called Who Killed JR? Does anyone remember that? All right, let's go with The Simpsons, all right? Has anyone here watched The Simpsons? Is anyone here? Was anyone brought up in a Christian home where mum and dad said you're not allowed to watch The Simpsons? Yeah, oh yeah, there it is. There's a bunch of hands going up all across the building. (laughs) What do you reckon was one of the most significant episodes of The Simpsons? Anyone want to have a clue? I've given you a bit of a hint already. Monterey was good, yes, Luke. Who killed, who killed Mr. Burns? So there's an episode of The Simpsons where Mr. Burns, owner of the nuclear plant, is, they think he's dead. I don't think he was, but they're trying to work out who killed him. Perhaps more seriously, think about Princess Di, Princess Diana, and how she died, and all the conspiracy theories around that. Who was involved in that? Was there someone involved? Go back to generations, and I reckon you guys have heard of JFK, American president, killed. Who killed him? Which leads us, in a very roundabout way, to our scripture tonight. Where, stay with me, where Peter gets up in front of people for the very first time as an empowered, spirit-filled disciple of Jesus. The very first sermon, really, that's going to be given. And he's going to talk about who killed Jesus. And who is actually responsible for that? And it's a really poignant question. Let's have a read of it. Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 36. So this is Peter preaching in front of everyone. That was their feast of Pentecost. A lot of people in the city. A lot of people had come for the feast. There's a lot of people gathered. A lot of people listening. Last week, if you were here... Pentecost had happened. The Holy Spirit had come down from heaven, filled that group of Christians, 120 in that room, empowered them, tongues of fire, other languages. Miracles had happened. The place shook. The biggest, most significant audiovisual display that this group of people had ever seen had just happened. And Peter is standing up in front of a bunch of people. And what's he going to say? All eyes are on him. And back to the microphone. Do you know this church, this church right here, Cubaptus, some of you know that there used to be this uh, pulpit here. One of the reasons why there is this dome and that pulpit was there and used to stand up on there was because when this building was built, there was no amplification. There was no microphones. And so the whole building was actually designed acoustically so that dome would actually reflect the volume from the preacher's voice and he would preach out, she would preach out from that place and you'd be able to hear it at the back of the building because the building is sloped in the way that it is sloped. So this building was actually designed so you could hear someone speak even without a microphone. And so people have asked questions about this sermon that Peter gives because as you're about to discover, some of you have started reading ahead, thousands of people become Christians Tens of thousands of people probably heard this message. How did they hear it? I think there was a whole culture around listening. We know Jesus preached to the 5,000. He preached often to big groups of people. Here, Peter preaches to a really big group of people. I want you to imagine you're in that group. The place has gone dead silent. There's no microphone. Everyone just hanging on Peter's every word. What is he going to say? What's the message he's going to give? Empowered by the Holy Spirit. So let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus 
whom you crucified. Just imagine that. Whom you crucified. To be both Lord and Messiah. Peter's words pierced their hearts, and they said to him and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, Each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you and to your children and even to the Gentiles, all who have been called by the Lord our God. Then Peter continued preaching for a long time. For a long time, church, he continued preaching. We're going for about 25 to 27 minutes tonight. Pre- Peter preached for a long time. It's not all there what he said. There's a lot more to it, but Luke picks out the highlights. Strongly urging all his listeners, save yourself from this crooked generation. Listen to this. Those who believed what Peter said were baptised and added to the church that day about 3,000 in all. Just as a little tangent on that, why, why does Luke include 3,000? Why does he say 3,000 people were added? Why didn't he just say oh, a big bunch of people became Christians? You know, if you have got cash in your wallet, probably none of you do, but cash in your account, you know how much money you've got in your, in your account. You count it. It's valuable to you. You count what is valuable. They counted those 3,000 people because every single person that said yes to Jesus in that moment was really valuable. And it was also extraordinary that 3,000 people became Christians in one day. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions, shared the money with those in need, worshipped together at the Lord's at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. This is like the best meal. This is like reading this passage, do you find this so interesting? I find this absolutely fascinating. This is the start of the church. This is the first sermon that's been preached. Peter is like setting the agenda for us. It's incredible. Calvin, can we have our first slide? Thank you. Peter's message is to a is a message that challenges. As he sets up this way that the church is going to operate, the value that it's going to operate. Peter is not giving some seeker-sensitive message. He's saying something which the words that he speaks, you can just imagine what the crowd was feeling as he said, it's you that have crucified Jesus. You see, this is so bad because these people, particularly there would have been a lot of Jewish people, and for hundreds, perhaps even thousands of years, they had prayed to God in heaven, please send the Messiah. The Romans uh, had taken over Israel, taken over Jerusalem, set up camp, put them under bondage, and the promised Messiah, Isaiah 53, all the way back to Genesis, the Messiah has been promised. And so uh, generation after generation of people in Israel had prayed that the Messiah would come. He comes, he turns up, and what do they do? They kill him. They crucify him. Just days before, the same people here saying, Peter, what do we do? What do we do? These same people had been in the crowd saying, crucify him, crucify him. Don't worry about Barabbas. Take Jesus. You can imagine what is going on for them. They're hearts are pierced you know Peter as he gives this word I can't help but think about who Peter was Peter the disciple 
What is it that made him so transformed? What is, what is it about him that, that brought about such change? It wasn't that long ago that we saw Peter with his hands around the charcoal. Slave girl comes up to him. Did you know him? No, I didn't know him. Second time, someone says to him, surely you were one of them. You look like them. You're from Galilee. No, it wasn't me. Don't even know him. Third time, I'm sure you were one of Jesus' disciples as Jesus is over there uh, being tried at, at the court and Peter's watching this from a distance, warming his hands. I didn't know him. Leave me alone. Now, the scene, what, what's happened? What's changed? Because here is Peter, the first message, the same people in the crowd that had led Jesus away to be crucified and they'd killed him, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the people, the ordinary people that lived in that city, they're all still there. And Peter is out here saying, it was you lot that crucified him. What has changed? What has happened? Well, the Holy Spirit has come down. You see, the church is a church that is empowered. We're part of an empowered church. Can we go to the next slide, please, Calvin? You know, as much as what this was a message which was to pierce them to their hearts, it's also a message where the people's response is, what do we do to be saved? Repent, be baptised, come follow Jesus. Interesting that he says baptism. Interesting that he calls them to be baptised. What would happen in those days was, if you're a Jewish person and you were going to temple and you were going to make a sacrifice, you would need to find a way to be cleansed. Perhaps you'd touched an unclean body. Perhaps you'd eaten something that you shouldn't have eaten. All around the temple were all these little ponds and that's exactly what they were. And if you were unclean in any way, you would go and you would baptise yourself. You would immerse yourself in that water and you would do it to yourself. You'd jump in there and then you could go up to temple and you could make your sacrifice. You could, could go join the other worshippers. Peter's call to be baptised is actually like that but different. The, the language that he uses is actually go and be baptised. You see, there's something different that's going on here. Something beyond just you singularly going yourself and jumping into a, a, a puddle of water and saying, now I'm cleansed, now I'm off to temple. There's something quite different that happens here. And it's something that has formed us as a church. In fact, it's formed every church ever since. When you get baptised, you're a believer. You believe in Jesus. It's not that you're not a Christian. When you get baptised, you are actually being welcomed into the church in a very public way. You're being welcomed into the body of Christ. You're actually, I was talking to someone this morning about being baptised and saying, I want to be baptised. And I said to them, you know what, when you get baptised, it's like you get a, a flag and you stick that flag in the ground and you say, this is me, I am a Christian, I am part of the church. You see, when you, what Peter was actually asking them to do was to come out of the crowd, the called out ones, the ecclesia, to come out of the crowd to grab a Christian and say, I want to be baptised, I want to be part of the church. And to be a part of the church back in that day meant, obviously, you know, we're opening ourselves up to persecution and all the rest. But they did. There was no baptism classes. There was no checking on them. Because if you were going to say you're a Christian back then, well, you were going to be a Christian. And they're welcomed into the church by the church. You get baptised by a Christian, and you come into the church. Can I say, and can I encourage all of you, you haven't been baptised yet, but you say you're a Christian and you are a Christian, then maybe it's time that you grab that flag, you grab that pole and you stuck it in the ground. You say, yes, I am a Christian. Yes, I am part of the church. And here it is. You can see it. No holding back. Some of you haven't yet made that choice and haven't yet made that decision. And baptism may very well be the moment that you prove to yourself, actually, I believe this. Actually, this is who I am. Actually, I want to be part of the church. 
Interestingly enough, in this passage of Scripture, we could, left, we could be left thinking, well, actually, it's the Jewish people that killed Jesus. I mean, that's not even necessarily historically true. I mean, the Jewish people didn't grab Jesus and put nails through his hands and put him up on the cross. That was the Roman soldiers. All through the centuries, people have used this as an excuse to persecute the Jewish people, to, to persecute the nation of Israel. The truth is that if you want to know who was responsible for Jesus' death, you don't actually need to go very far. All have sinned, all have fallen short of the glory of God. Who's responsible for Jesus having to go to the cross? You are. You're actually responsible for that. I was brought up in a fairly strict, fairly conservative Christian home, and um, it wasn't until about the age of 19. I've talked about a little bit about this last week, but around about the age of 19, I had this dream, and it was a really vivid dream. And I woke up thinking about this dream that I'd had. And in this dream, I just had this overwhelming sense that God was saying to me, Mark, I have given you such a good foundation for your life. I've given you parents that love you and care about you and have shared about Jesus with you. So many people in the world don't have that. And what are you doing with it? At the moment, I wasn't doing anything with it. In fact, I was doing stuff I shouldn't have been doing. But there was this real sense that I had of the responsibility that I have. I've heard the good news. What have I done with it? I remember my baptism down at, I don't think any of you will know this, but Emu Point down at Albany, freezing cold ocean. And I remember what just an incredible experience it was as I was baptized in front of friends and randoms driving past. But for me, it was like, yeah, this is actually who I am. I'm a Christian. I'm a believer. You know, there's a saying that goes around about being kind to ourselves. And that's, that's an okay saying. I don't have a problem with saying be kind to yourselves. But there's something about it just not exactly right. What you actually want is to experience God's kindness. And the kindness that God has for you. It's far more important to let God be kind to us, to receive his forgiveness. This is the point about being a Christian. You accept responsibility for who you are. You accept responsibility for the fact you've messed up. You accept responsibility for the fact that Jesus actually had to go to the cross for me, and I'm going to accept his kindness. I just want to encourage you, if you haven't been baptized yet, come and see myself or Pastor Lauren, Pastor Miriam. We'd love to invite you into the church and say, yeah, you're a Christian. You're a believer. Can we have the next slide, please, Calvin? A church that is forgiven and empowered. What was it that made Peter change? It was the power of the Holy Spirit. Was it the fact that he was a great preacher, that 3,000 people became Christians? No. Was it the fact that he was very eloquent? No. In fact, what we know about Peter, if we look through the New Testament, is he was the guy that always said something just a bit dumb, if we're honest. It's like, you know, this amazing transfiguration takes place. Hey, God, let's build three tents. It's like, what are you, what are you talking about? Three tents, Peter. Uh, he just spoke up. You know, hey, Jesus, you're washing everyone's feet. I'm really sinful. Why don't you wash the whole of well, my whole body? You know, let's just do the whole thing. It's like Peter just said that he just spoke from his heart. Here he speaks. And I don't know whether anything has actually changed in his humanity. I don't know whether he suddenly was blessed with the most eloquent words and the, the biggest dictionary, the biggest theosaurus or whatever it was. What changed that 3,000 people became Christians in that moment? It was purely the fact that the Holy Spirit had came upon him. And I've got a great quote, which I want to show now. Thanks, Calvin. A church 
that is forgiven and empowered. Peter and the apostles know that the positive response of leaders, listeners who commit their lives to faith in Jesus and who are baptised and added to the church is not the result of good methods of proclaiming the gospel. And they know that rejection, opposition and persecution are not the result of inferior evangelistic methods. They know that it is God who calls people to salvation, which means that conversions are always a mystery, bound up with the sovereign grace of God, whether they are conversions of a few individuals or mass conversions. Here's the thing, right, about Peter preaching, and I really want you to stay with me. Some of you are going to think, what the heck is Mark talking about? What actually happened is 3,000 people became Christians. Did Jesus ever get 3,000 people in one day to become Christians? Not that I read. In fact, Jesus starts off with 12 disciples, one of whom betrayed him. Peter, who then abandoned him. In fact, you read the gospel accounts and it feels like it's only John at the very end who stuck with him. At one time he preaches and the Bible says a bunch of people left him. Off they went. His words were too hard. When we get to the early church, we've got 120 people meeting in the upper room. I mean, that's great. But that's not 3,000. Was was Peter a better preacher than Jesus? What What changed? Maybe you know the scripture where Jesus says to his disciples, greater things you will do than even you have seen me do. At this moment in time, Peter preaches a sermon which perhaps was good. It must have been good. But I don't think there was anything particularly special about him or special about the words he used. But when Jesus left earth and went back up to heaven, the Holy Spirit comes down. The Holy Spirit empowers the church and incredible things can happen. You know when you share your faith. You know when you share your story oh, I wish I'd said this, or I wish I'd got that right, or I wish I'd used this word instead, or that was a really good answer. I wish I'd said that in that moment. You know, we all have those moments where perhaps we feel a pang of regret that we haven't exactly said the right thing. God can use anything and anyone. Peter was pretty ordinary. God can use you. This is actually what, God does. He uses some pretty ordinary people to do the things he wants to do and get done. You may think you can't be useful. Can I say you are incredibly useful to God. He just wants someone that will humble themselves, ask for him to empower them, and just say the words. And don't knock yourself out if you don't get it exactly right. I don't reckon Peter got it exactly right either. The 3,000 people came. Why did, why did they become Christians? Because they were empowered by the Holy Spirit. It's an incredible story. You know, just to finish off, I've got four things just to run through real quick. Can we have the next slide, Calvin? Four things real quick about the church. A radical church is a church that worships Jesus as Lord. This is so interesting what happens here. I've done a bit of a deep dive on what happens here. But... When someone became baptised, when someone got baptised in the early church, they had this whole system of government where Caesar Augustus had set this thing up about 40 years before Jesus came along, where he basically had said, if you want to be a Roman citizen, if you want to be part of the whole system that we have, good roads, good government, keeping all the hordes out of the Roman Empire, if you want to be part of that, you need to say... That's Caesar Curios, which basically means Caesar is Lord. You see, Caesar had this, Caesar Augustus had this whole view of himself that he was actually divine, that he was actually God. And he had such an ego that he wanted everyone else to say that as well. Caesar is Lord. Christians came along and they're like, we want to pay our tax. We want to be good citizens. But in fact, we can't say that. We can't say that Caesar is Lord. You know what they would do? It's incredible. This is true. When they were going to get baptised and they got baptised, they would come out 
I would come out of the baptismal and I don't know if you've ever seen the artwork, but you often see Caesar and other people raising their hands like that. The Christians would actually come out of the baptism and they would actually raise their hands and they would say, Jesus is Lord. It was actually an act of rebellion against the government of the day because they're like, Caesar, you're not God. Actually, Jesus is Lord. Do you know this is something that is carried down amongst churches all throughout the ages? When we raise our hands, when we worship God, our hands are open. Can you imagine the disciples? Jesus goes up to heaven. Can you imagine them standing there? Jesus is Lord. Can you imagine them? The crowd is watching. The Roman soldiers are watching. Everyone's looking at them. You need to say Caesar is Lord. No. Jesus is Lord. It's an act, an open-handed act of worship to our God. When you see people raise their hands in church, it's an act of worship. Jesus is Lord. He is my Lord. My hands are open. My eyes are lifted up to the heavens. Jesus is Lord. No one else is Lord. (laughs) It's almost an act of rebellion against this world and its government. It's really almost what it is. We're a church that has a radical view of possession. And you see that in that scripture. There's this ad on TV at the moment. I don't know if you've seen it. But something about it really annoyed me. And it's these two guys. Maybe some of you have seen it. It's an ad about insurance, car insurance. There's two blokes, and they're standing there in the driveway. One guy's got a shiny new ute, right? And his mate needs to move some stuff. So the guy with the shiny new ute grabs his keys and chucks them to his mate, said, hey, borrow my ute. Take my ute. You drive. Move your stuff. Do whatever. And the guy said, are you sure you let me use your brand new ute? And the point about that illustration is the insurance basically said, now you are covered. If your mate scratches your ute or dents your ute or whatever, you are covered. Your mate's covered as well as you. So it's like, I'll be generous to you as long as there's no risk that it's going to cost me anything. As long as it doesn't cost me anything, borrow my ute. You know, Christians, as a community... We're actually meant to look at each other and think about each other's needs and just give to each other without any sense of selfishness. Here's the thing about your possessions and the shiny things you own. Do you own them or do they own you? Do you own them or do they own you? We as Christians and as believers, we have this whole view that well, we're, mate, we're just passing through. Sure, it's nice to have shiny new things. Who doesn't like to have something shiny and new? Nothing wrong with that. But it doesn't own you. You own it. And if Jesus has reason to use it, Jesus as in someone, don't be taken advantage of. I'm not saying that. But look out for each other's needs. We had a radical view of possessions. We have a radical view of community. They sit there, they meet each other, they go to each other's homes, they bless each other in an incredible way. And it's a church that grows. The amazing thing about this story, I love this story, is the church goes from 120 meeting in that upper room. The Holy Spirit comes down in power Peter preaches this sermon. 3,000 people become Christians. A short time later, daily people are being added to their number. The church is up to 5,000. Later on in the book of Acts, as we get going, there's going to be tens of thousands of people that become Christians. Christianity has not stopped, and it's never stopped. And the gospel, oh man, I'm going to preach. The gospel of Jesus has never stopped. And it's never stopped being powerful. And it's never stopped changing people's lives. You can believe. You can believe in the gospel. It is true. People are still becoming Christians today. And people you never thought would become Christians are becoming Christians. The Holy Spirit is powerful. And he is in you. And together, 
as a church, we can see his presence work through us in incredible and mighty ways. So if I'm going to do anything tonight as I come to a close, I want to be a dealer in hope. I want to be a dealer in hope. And I want to say to you, don't be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus. It's powerful. It's amazing. And (laughs) think about this. I promise this is the last thing I'm going to say, all right? Your faith, your Christianity, if you were smart enough and you knew enough, you could trace it back. You could trace your Christianity and your faith. You could go back to that sermon that Peter preached. Someone in that crowd shared their faith with someone who shared it with someone who shared it with someone. And now you're here. Thank you, Lord, so much. You are so good to us, Jesus. And you have been so good to us. Thank you, Lord, that when we say sorry, when we take responsibility, Lord, you forgive us. Lord, I want to pray for every single soul in this building. May we all be aware of your holy presence. May we all make really good decisions. Lord, may some of us get baptised in the next few weeks. May we celebrate with those that say yes to you in a public way. Lord, I want to pray for someone here tonight who has someone in their heart that they really want to share with, but they haven't found the right words. The right moment. (laughs) The right formula. God, we don't need any of that. We've got the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, empower us to be purveyors of hope wherever we are. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.